Did you know that five out of seven billion people in this world do not have access to safe, affordable and timely anesthesia and surgery? This is what I'm going to share with you in the next minutes. These are my conflicts of interest. As you can see, I wear many hats, uh, but uh, the only place that gives me money is my hospital, uh, which uh, is very generous to allow me to go for meetings like this and present this story. I represent the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, which is uniting un anesthesiologists all over the world. We are 100 and 50 countries together, a federation of national societies. And our goal is to ensure that every patient in this world have access to safe anesthesia. And we do this with the national societies like your own in your countries in, uh, and in other countries as well. And in this uh, work, uh, we have to go back a few years uh, into 2015 because that was a very important year for global anesthesia, uh, as uh, there were three important events which I will uh, discuss a little in detail. One of them was the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. Here it is the Lancet coming, bringing together 25 commissioners with different backgrounds, different medical backgrounds and so on, and including advisors and researchers from 110 countries. And what they were, were set up to do was to see uh, the situation and the needs of global surgery and anesthesia in this world. The results were first presented in April 2015. Here you can see in London, Atul Gawande, which is probably known to many of you for the surgical checklist, uh, presented the findings. And now you will see some of those findings as well. It turned out that five out of seven billion people do not have access to safe and affordable surgery and anesthesia when they need it. It's amazing high amount of people in need. And you know, almost 17 million lives were lost from these conditions that needed surgical care uh, nine years ago. And that is more than four times as many as died from AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria combined. The problem is that people don't know about this. And they also found out that there is a shortage. If you go to a bare minimum of more than 2 million specialist surgeons, anesthesiologists and obstetricians worldwide. What do we do with this? Here you can see the map, the world map, and you will not uh, be surprised to see that the reddest part of the uh, Countries in worst situation is in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Southeast Asia. We in the Scandinavian countries are very fortunate in our position, as you would all know. They also found that uh, you need to increase uh, the number of procedures by 40%. And at that time in 2010, only 6% of the surgical procedures were performed in the poorest one-third of the world. Not only that, 13, uh, 33 million people face catastrophic health expenditure due to payment to surgery. Also, just to go to the, to the hospitals, to reach the hospitals costed us, and again, the poorest are the most affected. They also calculated that if you invest 3 billion in improving the services, the turn back or the, uh, uh, what you will give back is the same as 30 billion dollars, 10 times um, payback on your investments. So that was a very important thing that happened. With this background, all the world's, together, all the world's countries together at the World Health Assembly in 2015, they passed a uh, resolution to strengthen uh, the, the surgical and the anesthesia care in this world. And it's interesting because it's very rare in the World Health Organization that they can agree upon something. This resolution was unanimous. 
So all countries in the world decided that they would have to work on this. The problem is, of course, that more than 80% of these resolutions are left in the drawer. So unless somebody makes an effort to follow up and to work on them, they will remain in the drawer. And who are the best suited people to push and to influence the governments and so on to make them do what they have decided to do? It sets the context and it urges the member states to take action. But there was no money involved. And you know, without money, there will often be just goodwill. And that has been the problem, as it has been uh, for other things as well. And Paul Farmer said that surgery is a neglected stepchild of global health. But then we have Craig McLean saying that if that's the case, anesthesia is his invisible friend. And again, it's up to us as anesthesiologists to work on this and to make sure that everybody knows about it. So in order to do that, we have to work on advocacy. What we did in the World Federation is that we knew that if you don't have figures, nothing will happen, nothing will improve, because then it's all wishy-washy that you just think that you need to do something. So we set out to, uh, to make an online workforce map, counting all anesthesia providers in this world. And we did, we have got uh, input from all countries in the world. Of course, these calculations and countings are, uh, are linked with all sorts of weaknesses, but this is the best that we can get. And so until now, we have been able to uh, get figures from all the numbers except from North Korea. And you can see again that this reflects uh, the map uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, access to global surgery. So what workforce density should be uh, important? The, the Lancet Commission target was that you needed 20 surgical anesthesia and obstetric uh, providers per 100,000. How many of those should be anesthesiologists? Well, we thought that you cannot have everybody uh, providing anesthesia. You have to be, have leaders to develop the services, to teach, and also some sort of delivery of patient care. But it's really the leaders we are working on. And we thought, OK, it's very modest if we say that we would need five out of those 20 should be anesthesiologists as a first step. You can see here that even when we had included the non-physician providers, there were 70 countries that had less than those five, five per 100,000, reflecting the same uh, uh, shortage as the Lancet Commission reviewed. Here is a figures from Denmark reported from the Danish Society. This is an interactive map, so you can, uh, you can uh, click on the lowest uh, uh, part of that column and you will find more details on, on uh, Denmark. This is Denmark. If you come to a country like the Central African Republic, there is zero. We trained one to go in there. He was killed in the war. We trained another one to go in to lead the services in CAR. He was killed in the war. And then we trained a third one, but for some reason he was not so keen to go back to his country. Because we know that this is also used as a weapon of war to kill health personnel. We found that if we set this minimum target today, we will need 136,000 new physician anesthesia providers. We all know that this is an enormous number. So then we have to set up how can we get on from there? How can we try to minimize the urgent need that there is now? So, of course, education is the heart of the matter. And the problem with education is that to train a physician, there is all sorts of durations of training, all sorts of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, ways to train uh, an so-called anesthesiologist. We are different in all the countries. But in many of these pro uh, countries, it's also a problem about basic illiteracy. If people do not know how to count and read, how can you suddenly produce all those physicians? 
And the paradox is, of course, that the places that most need to train people don't have the time or resources to do it. Here you can see me, I'm visiting uh, Kesete. He's a nurse anesthetist in Eritrea. He set up a training plan in Ethiopia to train nurses. Then you all know that there have been uh, uh, wars between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. So he was kicked out and he set up a training school for nurse, nurses to become anesthesiologists in his own country. He was himself originally a midwife and uh, he, he um, saw that he couldn't help uh, C-sections without having anesthesia. You can see his textbook is on the middle photo there and his simulation center to the right. Single-handedly, he has been training almost all the anesthesia providers in Eritrea and he was a pioneer in Ethiopia as well. The thing is, when we train, it's good that we do have projects. It's good that we do go to countries and do, do nice things there. But we need to remember that when we go to countries to work and so on, it's the education that is more important than the service delivery. So our aim must really be to train uh, people to deliver further trainers so we can grow in their footsteps. So just to give an example of what we are doing in the World Federation, we have fellowship training programs all over the world for specialist and basic training, taking people from the region. And our primary place we went was uh, to Bangkok. It started in 1996 taking people from the neighborhood coming there. And I can give you one example from Mongolia. They had no anesthesia providers in Mongolia. Then they came to Bangkok, leaving their families for one year uh, and their homes and everything. They were being trained in a, a third language and the same from our volunteer colleagues in Bangkok, teaching people without any pay or anything for one year. Now, there have been uh, so many Mongolian anesthesiologists trained in Bangkok that they have got over this basic critical mass so they can continue training in their own country. Again, an overview of the training programs. Sorry, I went the wrong direction, but you can fix this. And here I have to give you another uh, interesting example. I love Rød, was working there, and sometimes it's very cold in this mountain, uh, town in Norway to work there with giving anesthesia. And in free times, I get some emails. I work on emails. And one day, I had an email from Dr. Shiana. She the own, was at that time the only anesthesiologist on the Maldives. And she wrote to me, Janneke, yesterday we almost lost an eight-year-old doing uh, uh, undergoing uh, circumcision because we couldn't maintain his airways. It was a matter of horror, seeing a healthy child almost dying because we were incompetent. Do you have any suggestions? And I knew that in India, we had a ba in Bangalore, there was a training center for pediatric anesthesia. So I wrote to Rebecca in Bangalore saying, Rebecca, read this email. And you know, within one hour, when I was here in this ice cold environment, I had fixed Dr. Shiyama a training place in uh, in uh, Bangalore, so she could come back to uh, the Maldives providing safe anesthesia. How much do we think about these things when we are snorkeling on the atolls outside the Maldives? But then there is another problem, of course, because what should be the minimum? You, have, you can never get the desirable versus the feasible. You have to, to make some kind of, of of level, what you think is the minimum. And uh, it, it's, it's clear that one size does not fit all, and it's also a problem that we, in our different countries, we have different cultures, different rewards. So in large parts of the world, uh, due to historical and cultural issues, they don't want to see anyone than physicians providing anesthesia. But what we had to say then, we had to make a position statement that uh, we need to have uh, anesthesia should be provided, led or overseen by an anesthesiologist. Teamwork is important, but you must sometimes uh, accept that not only physicians can do it. And by the, those who voted, all the member countries agreed and approved that. And this is one of the messages we are giving when we are on the, at the uh, World Health Assembly. 
giving statements to the governments, telling them that they had to, to improve the situation in their country and take the lead themselves. Unless you get the governments on board, you will not get nowhere with all our nice projects and so on. So the challenges really are safety and quality. Nå bare sier jeg, nå tror jeg dere må kutte litt innimellom, men det er for å gjøre dette i hvert fall. When it comes to safety and quality, we are working with, uh, with uh, many organizations, as you can see. But as this is a, is a Scandinavian uh, Congress, I would like to highlight uh, what we did when I was the president of the European Board working with the ESA. And uh, it will be 10 years next year that uh, the Helsinki uh, Declaration on Patient Safety and Anesthesiology was, uh, was uh, launched. And that was a great event in Helsinki and a great contribution by Scandinavians, I must say. Uh, to, to safety, that we were able uh, to, to launch this in Helsinki. It was a great uh, uh, day, but again, unless it's followed up, it is for nothing. We have developed this for Europe, but at that time we didn't understand or realize that the rest of the world was also just waiting for something like this to happen. So we were invited to all these countries, all these parts of the world uh, that wanted to sign up to the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety. And here you can see how much it has spread worldwide. This is one aim made by anesthesiologists, how we must work all together. Physicians, politicians, uh, trainers, nurses, other clinicians, uh, and, uh, and the industry, all parties must work together. So this is a very good framework that can be used. Another example of working uh, people coming together, because that's what is uh, important if you are going to improve patient safety in rich and poor countries alike, is to come together. And the patient safety movement is one of those ways that uh, we can do that, coming together and create safe uh, polit policies and so on. And when I show you this photo, of course it's nice for me that I have shaked hands with Clinton. But uh, the main important, main thing with uh, this thing is to illustrate that sometimes we as clinicians feel that we are, we are fighting winnings. So unless we can get patients and politicians on board understanding that they have to deliver the message. I asked uh, 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 Clinton to tell my prime minister that she had to make this thing because I have a feeling she doesn't listen to me, so maybe she would listen to Clinton. And, uh, and well, I'm not sure if it helped, but at least that we have to try to work with every person we meet to make them understand that this is important. Anesthesia safety is improving, as you can see from this slide, showing, uh, showing uh, uh, the years and the anesthesia soul mortality. But that goes for high-income countries. It's not improving for low- and middle-income countries. The surgical uh, anesthetic mortality, these are some older data, but they have not improved much, and you can see some of them are ghastly. In Togo, one, in this study, one out of 133 uh, died. So what, uh, what is the solution in some of these places? is that they try to uh, have uh, ketamine-based training non-physician for five days, and they say that's better than nothing. Is it really? That's what we don't think as, uh, as uh, anesthesiologists. This is run by emergency physicians from Boston and getting USA funding. What we have done is to work with the World, Organis uh, World Health Organization and to have international standards for safe practice in anesthesia, and that goes for all countries including your own. And of course, of course, it's harder. And as you can see, the, the, they uh, put the importance here, how to have the international expectation standards. There should be on one standard all over, wherever the patient is so important, wherever it is. And it has to be used as a political tool. Here are the contents of the, on the international standard, as you can see. 
And uh, it's important that every patient has one person who looks after him. And you can also see here the standards for monitoring. Highly recommended is uh, the WHO word for must. But uh, of course, this is not uh, possible all over yet. So, I have mentioned before that we have to have data in order to fix and improve the perioperative outcomes. And uh, we have been lucky because finally the World Bank has included data in, uh, in uh, its uh, perioperative mortality data, but it's measured in so many different ways. So what we did this summer, we, we assembled experts in surgery obstetrics, anesthesia, uh, from the World Bank, from United Nations, from World Health Organization, locked them up in Utstein Monastery for two days uh, in order to agree on how we can have one uniform uh, reporting uh, uh, style for perioperative data in all over the world so we can compare. So I have told you how important it is that we work on, uh, with the governments. And you can see here, this is from two years ago in the World Health Assembly, when Zambia and Zimbabwe launched their national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans. You can see this from the bottom. And what was interesting at that time, we had to push ourselves into all the ministries, trying to make them listen. And we go further, and they there. And then it became so popular that everybody in so many countries wanted to make their own plans. So we had a workshop in Dubai making a framework for how those countries could, pre could prepare them, uh, their plans. And here is the policy brief which we have been using. And uh, the countries uh, can use that to improve uh, the, the improvement and how things are changing. Last year, the Pakistani government came to ask us how we could help out and we have traveled around and now more than 40 countries in the world are pre-planning those plans. And that's the first tool uh, or first step to make the governments take responsibility. This is from the opening session of the World Health uh, Organization this year. And it was uh, the editor-in-chief of, of The Lancet, Richard Horton, who gave the uh, opening speech. And he gave these five messages to all countries. One, gender equality. Two, environment, climate. Three, improve the situation for global anesthesia and surgery. Four, fund the WHO. Five, bring your Minister of Finance next time. So this was the only problem, health problem, that he mentioned to all of them. And uh, we may have, uh, experienced a different style this time because now so many governments came to us to ask for our input. Here is uh, we have a meeting of a health minister from Myanmar asking us for help and others. Finally, I want to share with you a, a big problem also on the international level. It's about ketamine, because as we know, in many countries of the world, there is limited capacity for anesthesia. You can see here how many uh, operation theaters do not have running water, electricity, and oxygen. So what is the solution if you don't have any of those, if you don't have an anesthesia machine, not a pulse oximeter? Ketamine. And the problem is now that China wants to make it a scheduled drug because they have, a part, uh, outside of China, it's been used as a, a party drug, Chinese ketamine, and they want to have a stop for that. And that would be a big problem if that happens. You can see here is how it's being used for emergency C-suction. This is in Burundi. Even in natal surgery, it has been used. And here is, uh, here is uh, also a, a laparotomy, ketamine only. So what happens if, you, if that is scheduled? Let's see what happened in India uh, when they uh, scheduled morphine. Well, 
uh, they made it so difficult to get out of the pharmacy. So you needed six, uh, six different uh, uh, notes to fill in in order to get it out of the pharmacy. So the far nobody did that, so the pharmacy stopped stocking it. And then the manufacturer said, well, nobody's asking for ketamine anymore, so we stop, the, stop it. So the medicinal use of morphine dropped by 97% after the law was enacted. And we can easily see the same thing happening to ketamine. And we will end up in this situation, which was during the embargo in Iraq, when they had to perform procedures without any anesthesia whatsoever. So we have to work, we have to lobby on this all together. And this will come back, so we might have to turn to you to work with your governments to influence uh, those uh, United Nations organizations. We are doing campaigns, as you can see, and, uh, and trying to promote it in all different ways. So I have gone, gone through quite a number of things what we are doing in reaching the goals of Lancet Commission and Global Surgery. We need your help, we need your input from, from the Scandinavian countries. We are so well off in this world and well placed to influence our ministries of health to do more than, or foreign ministries or whatever, to do more than, uh, than uh, what they are doing now and change uh, their, their uh, views and work more on us to improve anesthesia and surgery in this world. You can read more. And uh, we will discuss more at the Congress, uh, World Congress next year. Thank you very much.